So we've been talking about the fact that it's in order to understand how evolution takes place, it's important to study populations because that popul evolution happens at the population level. It's never a member of the species that evolves, but the entire population. Therefore, you need to understand differences that exist within a population as well as similarities that exist across populations in order to understand how interactions between populations and within populations will lead to evolution. Now, we also talked about the fact that sexual reproduction basically sh reshuffles the genes which are already present, but don't necessarily change the LU frequencies available in the population. That all it does, it creates new genotype and phenotype frequencies or new looks based on building blocks that were already there. But when evolution takes place, you actually get a shift towards a certain LU. In other words, you're going to get a fixation of an LU in the population because that will have more advantages, which will become basically natural selection which is going to take place or because of some sort of random event or because of a migration which brings new values of that into the, gener into the population or takes some values away. Any of these events or even mutations can actually change the LU composition of the population and that is in itself evolution. And in order to understand that, a scientist and a mathematician got together, their name is called Hardy and Weinberg, to actually try to discover the process by which evolution took place. And in order to understand the process, they actually looked at equilibrium. What condition will make the evolution impossible, basically? What conditions would lead to evolutionary equilibrium or no microevolution? And they actually looked at the fact that large populations where it would be very hard for evolution to take hold or any changes to actually affect the population at large will actually slow down evolution. Likewise, random mating, which makes it impossible for specific groups to actually differentiate themselves from others are going to also slow down evolution because separation is crucial for evolution. Likewise, if you have no mutations, you're going to have no new genes to work with to create more variation. You also have no selection. You have no changes across generations. If you have no migration, you have no influx or outflux of genes to change the com of composition of a population. So if you take all those things away, basically, you have no evolution. You have instead equilibrium in the population. Now, if the opposite happens, that's when you're going to get evolution. And that's what they do to come up with this formula here. That's basically the Hardy-Weinberg theorem, all right? Or the idea that uh, you can use this alley frequencies to predict what happens across generations with or without evolution. And these formulas actually generate this graph here to represent how the ratios of each genotype are, are changed depending on how the alley frequencies of each um, value change and we'll talk, go back to this graph later to see what it's all about all right so the Heidi Weinberg theorem is basically based on the math that we already did two videos ago when you actually try to predict what's going to happen on the next population based on the previous generation of the population and it's basically what we already did so it shouldn't be too hard for you to guys just intellectualize that now basically what they're saying here is that they call the LU frequency of the dominant LU P and the LU frequency of the recessive LU Q so it goes in alphabetical order so it's pretty easy to remember but remember that we talked about that if you have only two LUs and that's what they're assuming here because you know in genetics it gets way more complicated than that it's usually multiple uh, uh, genes for one trait or one character. There's also things like epigenetics, which is the environment is going to make a difference. There's epistasis, there's platropy, all of these advanced genetic relationships that make this process actually much more complicated than what they're looking at here. But it's hard enough like this. So to simplify, we're going to look at as if the character is determined by only two values found at the same locus or position within the chromosome, just to keep things simple. And if all traits were like this, then that means that all the alleles you have are basically going to be the combination of the dominant and the recessive. So if you add the ratio of dominant and the ratio of recessive, you get 100% of all the alleles that there is. And, just, and that just makes sense, right? But for the genotype frequency, they did something similar. They called the homozygous dominant uh, genotype frequency P square. And the heterozygous genotype frequency 2PQ. And the homozygous recessive genotype frequency, they call it Q square. Now, since, again, you're going to have only three genotypes, one which is the two dominant values put together, the other one which is the two recessive values put together, and the other one that's the one dominant and one recessive, the sum of all the genotypes which are present are going to be all of which you have, so 100%. That means that you can also say that P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1. 
That means you generate two formulas on these principles, that the sum of all values equals one, and that just makes sense, and that the sum of all genotypes equals one, and again, that just makes sense, all right? But using these two formulas, you can make predictions about the way the generations are going to be passed on and also about the composition of any given population on any given generation. Basically, going to do a little bit of algebra here. So let's see how that works. By the way, before we do that, why would they say that P squared equals the homozygous dominant genotype frequency? Now, remember that when we did problems like this a couple of videos ago, we talked about the fact that in order to fi figure out the ratio on the next generation, you basically set up the LU frequencies in a Punnett square that looks like the F1 cross. So you get the ratio of the big A and the ratio of the little a, and you segregate them and make a Punnett square with the males and the females of each of each members of the species, and you calculate the ratio that's possible in the offspring. And remember, we did exactly like this. In order to find out, for example, the homozygous dominant ratio, you look at just this one box, because on the F1 cross, only one out of the four are going to be like that. But that when you do that, you don't just uh, multiply the genotypes, you also multiply the ratios of those values. Now, if the ratio of big A is P and the ratio of big A is P again over here, that means you're going to multiply P times P or P squared. Then that's why to calculate the homozygous dominant genotype ratio, it's going to be P squared. It's what we already did. It's just pointing letters to represent what we already did two videos ago. All right? Likewise, to get the recessive uh, genotype ratio, you're going to get what this box, which is basically multiplying the odds of each of the recessive uh, value ratios, and that stands for Q, so it's going to be Q times Q, or Q squared, and that's why the homozygous recessive stands for Q squared, and that again just makes sense. But since there are two boxes for the heterozygous look, you're going to do P times Q twice, and so that's why the heterozygous look is 2PQ, because you're basically getting P times Q twice since there's two out of the four boxes are like that. So in other words, the, the, you can go very easily from, from this, which is easy to memorize because P is dominant and Q is recessive, to this based on the principles that we already used two videos ago to determine the, the genotype frequencies on the generation following the previous generation using the F1 Punnett square. All right? So P plus Q equals 1. That means that some of the values is 100% of all the values. And P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared also equals 1. And that basically means that the sum of all genotypes is going to go be 100% of the genotypes that you have. And that just makes sense. All right? But remember, this will be really more complicated if you have something like multiple alleles or if you have traits which are pleiotropic, uh, epistasis, uh, epigenetics, or multifactorial. But we're going to keep it simple here to, in order to actually make this easable and feasible to actually work with. Now, using this then, we can work backwards from what we did two videos ago to try to determine the unknowns on the population. Because the thing is, um, these two here are going to be looked dominant. So it's very rare and very hard to actually differentiate between them, right? P squared plus 2PQ are, all, are always going to be the dominant look. So 2PQ plus P squared will look dominant. And the recessive, of course, there's only one way of looking like that, so the Q squared also is going to stand for the recessive look. So if they give you the uh, numbers like this, for example, a population of cats with 100 cats, and where 16 cats are white and 84 cats are black, and they're saying that the dominant is going to be the black. So if you have one big B, you're going to be black. So you see here that they're pretty much telling you the ratios of phenotypes here. All right, So you know that the dominant phenotype is going to be 84, out of the 100 that you have. So that means 84% or 0.84. But see, that is P squared plus 2PQ. So it's kind of hard for you to differentiate between the two of them. Uh, but the uh, recessive phenotype is going to be the rest, 16 out of the 100 that you have. And so that you, you're going to know that, therefore, Q squared is going to be uh, 0.16, right? Now, what they're asking you here is that if you know what Q square is, can you find how many individuals are going to be that and how many individuals are going to be like this? Can you find a number of homozygous dominant and a number of heterozygous individuals? So how do we do that? We use the Heidi-Weinberg theorem. So basically, it's working backwards from what we did before. Again, these are the three formulas that we were working on. 
right? So we have all the rules there in the corner so we can figure that out. So we already had figured out that our Q square, which stands for little b, little b, was 0.16 on the previous part. So now we know then that Q must be the square root of that. And if you actually do that in the calculator, you will see that it's going to be 0.4. Now, if you know what Q is, you look at the formula and you see that uh, P plus Q has to be equal to 1, so that you know that Q then has to be the difference between 1 and whatever P is, and therefore P equals 1 minus Q. And since Q is 0.4, that's going to be 0.6. But now that you know 0.6, you should know, therefore, that the frequency of big B is going to be 0.6, or so 60% of the population is going to be made up of big B values. And only 40% of the population is going to be made up of little b values. So you see how we're figuring out all our values already. And then, if you know what P is, you should be able to figure out what P square is. But it's basically just get 0.6 and make it squared. And you find out that it is 0.36. And that's going to be my ratio of homozygous dominant genotypes. And now that I know the homozygous dominant and the homozygous recessive, I should be able to quite easily figure out the ratio of the heterozygous, which is 2PQ. Because 2PQ is going to be 2 times this times that, so it's going to be 2 times 0.4 times 0.6, which is 0.48. Now, if you actually do the math backwards you can also see that 2pq would have, been, have to be the difference between what you already had and 1 because all the genotypes have to add up to 1 so there will be 0.36 plus 0.16 which is 0.52 and the 1 minus 0.52 is going to be 0.48 so it agrees and we know therefore that this is our heterozygous ratio so you see you figured out all the ratios including the uh, homozygous recessive, the homozygous dominant the heterozygous as well as the alley ratios for each trait now for the phenotypes that one will of course match the phenotype ratio and it's going to be the recessive look and the dominant look will be these two put together like we already had figured out on the previous slide that we did so you got 84 percent or 0.84 will look dominant and that's pretty much how you use the Heidi Weinberg theorem to figure out the alley ratios phenotype ratios and genotype ratios of a, a population and therefore discover uh, how the population makeup is like as long as the population is in genetic equilibrium or not evolving. Now note of course that as long as no evolution takes place these ratios will stay constant. So in other words if they say okay now that you figure this out figure out how many cats will be white on the next generation if a thousand cats are born. Well don't you no, know, go crazy with this. If there's no evolution, the ratios will be exactly the same. And so, if 16% of the cats were white in the previous generation, 16% of the cats will be white in the next generation, and you're going to get another 160 cats which are white. And so, don't get complicated. The ratios, the allele frequencies, and everything else will stay the same. Without actually changing the allele frequencies, everything will stay the same, and you can basically use the same ratios you figured out before. So what the Heidi Weinberg equilibrium means is that you can use a population that it's not evolving as, and as long as you know the ratio of the homozygous um, phenotype, which you usually will know because they're the only ones that look that way, or they're the only ones that don't look dominant, then you can do the math to figure out the frequency of the recessive uh, allele, and then the difference will be the dominant allele. So you jump from that to this, and then once you know that, you can actually calculate uh, the Punnett square like we did before and figure it out that what P square is going to be like and you also figure out what B, B square is like and you also figure out what 2PQ is like. So basically the Heidi Weinberg principle allows us to figure out the gamete ratios and therefore the allele ratios and then also the genotype and phenotype ratios that show up in the population. So that is a very useful trick that you should know.